Pública. Hello and welcome to Issues and Answers, a production of the Government Information Service. I am Jolene Bisset Joseph. The Cancer Center of, the, of Eastern Caribbean, located in Antigua, was launched in July of 2015, offering high quality oncology services. In 2017, a branch of the center was opened right here in St. Lucia at the Tapio Hospital offering consultations and systemic therapy. Radiation treatment is provided at the Cancer Center in Antigua. Now, whilst a lot of us might have heard about the branch opening here in St. Lucia, many may still not be aware of how they can go about accessing radiation therapy at the center. So today, I am joined by a couple of individuals who are gonna give us some insight into how anybody who needs treatment can actually go about getting treatment from the center. So let me introduce Mr. Henry Hazel, who is oh, the yeah. Chief Operating officer at the center and Dr. Glenn Jones who is a radiation oncologist. Hello. Good morning. Thank you good for morning. joining me. Yes, good to be here. Great. Now firstly, can you give us a little background behind the center first of all? Well, way back in 2009, um, the heads of our OECS countries, they got together and they thought it fitting that we ought to properly have a cancer treatment facility within our OECS region. And so several years afterwards, um, via a public-private partnership, the establishment of the center came through to fruition July 1, 2015. The main facility located in Antigua, and uh, as you mentioned earlier on, we opened our branch here in St. Lucia in uh, April of 2017. Mm -hmm. So it is a treatment facility that serves the entire OECS, all nine countries of the OECS. And, uh, because of the level of investment for a radiation center itself, um, we can only have one at this particular point in time. Um, and so strategically and uh, by consensus, uh, it was agreed that it would be established in Antigua. But we have a chemotherapy capability here in St. Lucia via our facility as well. Of course, the consultations get done here as well. Mm -hmm. And throughout the rest of the OECS countries, we do what we call oncology, oncology clinics, okay. where our doctors actually go there, mainly in the government facilities to see cancer patients on a consultation basis. Mm -hmm. And then they would advise on uh, the treatment plans thereafter, and uh, they would be directed to where they ought to go, whether it is in Antigua or here in St. Lucia, if it's just a case of chemotherapy. Okay, excellent. Yes. Now, as I was saying, a lot of people, because uh, um, there was a lot of um, awareness put about when the branch first opened here in St. Yes. Lucia, so a lot of people know about the center, but not a lot of people know about how they can go about accessing treatment. Correct. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about the referral process? Right. So. I probably could allow Dr. Jones to deal with that, but I might just preface it by saying um, it all starts with a referral from your general physician, your mm -hmm. family physician, mm -hmm. and after that, that diagnosis is made, then that physician refers patients to us, the treatment center, to take okay. it from there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jones? Yeah, it's very important when a referral is made that we have a lot of the background information. So for instance, there may be imaging studies like CAT scans or mammograms, and we need those reports, but we often need to also see the images or the pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the pathology report. So for, um, for most patients who get cancer, there is a piece of the tissue, the cancer tissue, which is looked at in a lab, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a report on what type of cancer it might be. So we need that report as well. Sometimes we need it reviewed or further discussed. So uh, at that point then, there may be discussions between ourselves and the referring physicians and other physicians um, about the situation so that we can all share the same information, make sure that information is complete. If there's additional tests to be done, we can help direct that. And at some point uh, along this process, a decision can be made that it's now an opportune time to see the patient with their family, if need be, or friends, and then make a decision about what the best treatment should be. So sometimes that's immediate, especially if it's an urgent situation, mm -hmm. or it may take us several days. Right now, our typical time from referral to being seen is approximately six days, calendar okay. days. Okay, that's not bad at all. And that's, that's, I understand, that's followed by the consultation process, right? 
Yeah, a consultation, consultation process then happens um, okay. in one of the clinics, whether okay. it be here or in Antigua, for example. Okay. Now, during that part, I know there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, I guess many people have been touched by cancer, whereas they have people in their family who've had cancer. Yes. There's um, that part in the, where the patient is first diagnosed, where they go through, they themselves go through a lot of emotional turmoil. Will people be, um, go through any kind of stages with people from the center in, in that regard and, and being maybe guided in, in, in or reassured somewhat in, in you know, the steps they can be taken next? Because I know it becomes a very traumatic time for people. Yes, right, so um, our clinical staff, including our physicians and our therapists, they are very well equipped to provide that, that level of care mm -hmm. um, as part of the overall care. Mm -hmm. So even at the consultation stage, um, there's a certain amount of counseling that gets done. Um, what we would wish to happen, and we are planning for that in the future, is to actually either onboard as part of our staffing complement, um, specialized skilled um, counselors, or we strike strategic partnership um, with same persons um, to provide that level of care. So we will actually be referring to a specialist consultant um, in the area of um, counseling. Okay. Right. So. We actually know of a couple right here in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few in Antigua as well, too. And uh, the plan is to actually, you know, get everybody on board, you know, in this collaborative, um, I think, in this field, we call it um, shared management or something like that, yeah. as it relates to <coughs> okay. medical care being administered to a particular patient. Okay. Right. Yeah, distress is obviously common in just about every patient who has a diagnosis of cancer, right. and often in their families, mm -hmm. significant others. Mm -hmm. um, so we realize that. Uh, only about 10 or 20 percent of the patients, meaning out of every 10, one or two, will actually have significant distress that continues and is ongoing. Mm -hmm. One of the significant things that reduces distress uh, influences the emotions and helps move towards decision making mm -hmm. is to get critical information about what the cancer is, what's recommended, and what the treatment will be. Mm -hmm. So most studies demonstrate that once patients get that information, their yeah. stress level goes down considerably. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I think the primary goal of counseling and so on, if possible, mm -hmm. is to both deal with the distress, but also move towards a kind of a problem-solving strategy, uh, where you're sharing information, you're trying to, through the information, achieve consent for whatever the next step is, mm -hmm and then to proceed forward in a fairly uh, organized way. So we want a wise decision for the treatment, not the most expedient decision. Mm -hmm. We don't okay. want the fastest, we want yeah. the wisest. Okay. So yes. it does take a few days, <coughs> sometimes extra tests are needed and patients need to be aware of that, that okay. sometimes at the consultation a plan is not fully developed. Mm -hmm. And in fact it often takes further discussion with other doctors and maybe a team approach to actually come up with a plan. Okay. Once the plan is there then it's important to move swiftly to treatment and then to continue the treatment and adhere to the program as much as possible to get the best benefit. Okay, excellent. Now, I also understand that after that, there's actually a funding process as well, yeah? That's correct. Um, what exactly takes part during that process? Right, so almost immediately, um, we discuss with the patient how are they proposing to pay for their care. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be paid for, mm -hmm. right? So ideally, we have uh, three basic categories of patients. Um, insured patients, um, where patients have major medical insurance, and the insurance company would ideally take care of that. Okay. Um, oftentimes, on a cost-sharing basis, 80-20. Insurance pays 80% of the cost, and uh, the patient pays their copay of 20%. Okay. So in such an instance with an insured patient, we would immediately make contact with the insurance provider and uh, obtain what you call a pre-certification. This is an approval from the insurance company. Yes, this is our insured client. We will take care of their cause. Please go ahead and treat the patient. So that's essentially what they would say to us. Okay. So immediately we'll proceed um, to onboard that patient, discuss with them how they are going to pay for their copay. If they are in a position to pay it, then it is required that they do so upfront. If they're not in a position to pay that upfront, then we also have a payment plan for them okay. um, to deal with that particular copay. Okay. Right. So then there are those who do not have insurance and uh, they are in a position to pay for their costs, so they can simply write us a check or pull out their credit card or round up some cash uh, among themselves and family members, etc. So they come to us and they pay for their care. Okay. Um, again, if they are not able to pay all of it upfront, we have a payment plan mm -hmm. as well that we can put such patients on. Okay. Right. Um, Self-paying patients, as we call them, normally would get a 20% reduced rate relative to what we would bill an insurance company. Okay. Right, so 
you don't have insurance and you are not in a position to pay for your care yourself amongst yourself and your family, then uh, you would then have the option of looking to the government for some semblance of financial aid. Mm -hmm. right? There is a process to that as well in terms of touching base with the appropriate persons at the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, there's an approval process there. Mm -hmm. right? Once that gets approval, um, uh, we get communication via the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health indicating that they will be sponsoring this particular patient. On receipt of that, then we move almost immediately to onboard that particular patient. Um, if the treatment cost that we will ascribe to government-sponsored patient, and I can come back to that later on, is not totally covered by the government, mm -hmm. then we will also get into discussing with the patient how are they going to cover the shortfall on that. Now, I don't right. want to cut you short, but we just have to take a break for just a little while, and we're going to come back and hear a bit more about the payment process. Yes. Yeah? Okay. All right, then. So stay with us. We'll be back after this break. Pamela, I noticed that you built your retaining wall on my property. You will have to give me my land back or compensate me for that. My contractor isn't dumb. I trust that he will not build anything on your property. Where is your proof? Let's go to court. This situation does not require you to go to court. Looks like we have to go through mediation here. Mediation is a way people resolve conflicts like this. Someone, a third party, comes to speak to both parties. This person is called the mediator. The mediator is impartial. He or she makes sure that communication between both parties is effective and efficient. So, the mediator is a judge? No, the mediator is not a judge. Mediators, unlike judges, do not decide cases or impose settlements. Let me get a mediator to handle this retaining wall and that kitchen. Kitchen? Yes, your kitchen also falls on my land. Let me call the mediator. Welcome back to Issues and Answers. Today we are joined by the Cancer Center Eastern Caribbean. Um, we are actually joined by Mr. Henry Hazel and Dr. Glenn Jones, and they're telling us all about the um, accessing radiation treat therapy at the center. So we were talking about the payment process before we went to break, um, yes. Mr. Hazel. So if you could carry on just telling us a little bit about that. Right. So I was actually into discussing uh, the process as it relates to accessing uh, financial assistance from the government. Right. So once we receive approval from the Ministry of Health via mm -hmm. the Permanent Secretary, then we will proceed uh, to treat the patient. Um, our aim really is to start treatment as soon as possible because time is of the essence. Right? So our administrative process really has to be top notch in terms of the liaising that we have to do with the relevant persons. Now to talk a little bit about the payment plan that we offer, mm -hmm. and uh, this could apply to an insured patient who has um, a challenge paying for his copay. Mm -hmm. It could apply to a self-paying patient who is contemplating paying for their overall treatment costs. And it could apply to a government-sponsored patient as well where the government does not fully cover the amount agreed um, for the particular treatment. Mm -hmm. um, let me start with the government-funded patients first. Mm -hmm. uh, when we established, we indicated earlier, it was on a mandate from the governments of the OECS countries. And so inside of that agreement, we would uh, assist the government in making uh, oncology care available to citizens at reduced rates, particularly radiation therapy, mm -hmm. right, at reduced rates. Um, and uh, in that arrangement, we have agreed a flat fee of 10,000 US dollars for a course of radiation therapy. Okay. Now, to put that into perspective, mm -hmm. um, our fees for radiation therapy could go up to 40,000 US dollars, depending on the nature of the disease and uh, the techniques that are used mm -hmm. um, to devise the plan. Right. Right. Um, so, on the lower end of the scale, we have for a breast cancer, pat um, for example, at $22,500. Mm -hmm. And we get into the brain tumors that need VMAT um, planning and so on, okay. up to 40,000 yeah, 40, US dollars. Mm -hmm. Inside of that, irrespective of the disease we are treating, the complexity of the plan, a government-sponsored patient would be for 10,000 US dollars. The government of St. Lucia presently, um, they are aiming to cover the full 10,000 US dollars. Okay. Um, in our latest discussions with them, they are not yet there. Mm -hmm. um, what they provide presently is 10,000 EC dollars. Right, and so the patient now have to deal with um, trying to come up with the remainder, remainder. of the okay. seventeen thousand EC dollars. Mm -hmm. Right, so they have lot of, lots of 
workarounds for that. Um, other agencies, Common Board, like National Community Foundation, etc., and uh, lend assistance in this regard. Okay. Right. So we work with the patients. Mm -hmm. um, for a self pain and an insured patient who are trying to meet either overall costs or mm -hmm. their part of the copay, uh, we would offer a payment plan that would uh, require them to make at least 50% down payment mm -hmm. with us mm -hmm. and then we start treatment immediately. Okay. The remainder of that, um, ideally we would want to be repaid over the course of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, it is not always possible for all patients and so sometimes on a case-by-case -case basis mm -hmm. we extend beyond uh, the termination date of the treatment. Okay. Right. So if the treatment is going to finish, um, going to be completed within two months, um, there are times when we actually give patients up to maybe three, four, or five months um, to pay off the remainder of their balance with us. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Now, can you tell me about the treatment process itself, where in, in regards to like traveling to Antigua and accommodation and such like? So, uh, tell me a little bit about that process. Right on that. So again, as Dr. Jones mentioned earlier on, only if you need radiation or radiation combined with another protocol like mm -hmm. chemo, radiation or surgery and thing, you would need to travel to Antigua right. for that. Um, traveling to Antigua, uh, we have already made arrangements with property owners, um, guest house apartments, that would give us concessionary rates for accommodation. Um, radiation in Antigua could ideally span from, say, three weeks to up to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And so you would have to be present there in Antigua during that period of time because the treatment is daily. Okay. You come into the center you know, for about a half an hour every day, uh -huh. right, on a daily basis for that period of up to eight right. weeks. So, of course, you would need accommodation. Mm -hmm. And so that accommodation, um, we have agreements in terms of concessionary rates. Um, we make all of the arrangements. Patient comes through, of course, they would have to provide the funding for that. Mm -hmm. The patient would also have to ensure that they are financially equipped to take care of the uh, other incidentals, like mm -hmm. food and uh, small other incidentals. Okay. Transportation on the ground, we offer that free of charge for all incoming patients. We okay. even pick them up from the airport. Okay. Um, we have had experiences though um, for several St. Lucians who would come to Antigua. Mm. They would have already had uh, family connections or friend connections there, so they would have totally eliminated the pickup from okay. the airport, the day to the transportation mm -hmm. and the accommodations as well too. Okay, okay, yes. I get you. All right. Now I understand that there's also um, CT scan simulation, mm -hmm. right? And um, treatment planning. Tell us a little bit about that. No, this is Dr. Jones. Okay. So um, all, almost all the patients require a, a CAT scan. Mm -hmm. um, this CAT scan is usually done with no injection and if you have to swallow anything, it might just be a bottle of water mm -hmm. um, because we want the bladder and pelvic patients uh, that we're going to be treating uh, to be filled up in some cases. Right. So there is a little bit of patient preparation. So that is in, uh, that information is given to the patient so they can help prepare. Mm -hmm. Typically, though, the preparation can be done in the clinic. Mm -hmm. There's an appointment for about an hour for a CT scan. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very straightforward. And, and uh, there's a discussion with the person about what's going to happen. Uh, and then the scan is done. The scan mm -hmm. takes only a few seconds and it gives 300 roughly pictures through the body okay. of the area that we're going to treat. So okay. if we're doing breast cancer, for example, we scan from, from the jaw down to probably just below the, uh, the ribs. Mm -hmm. So we have the entire volume within which the breast and the lymph nodes are present. Mm -hmm. And then since each person differs from person to person, their shape and body composition is different. Mm -hmm. We have a unique information about each patient. So this then, um, there's some permanent little tattoo dots that may be placed on the skin with a little bit of a poke with a needle, mm -hmm. uh, with a bit of ink, uh, in order to assist in setup for all the treatments. Uh, at this point then, the information from the scan goes to the uh, physicians and the planners. And then what we do is we draw the target areas that we want to treat. We draw the areas that we want to avoid like the lungs, the heart, and other places like that. Mm -hmm. And then we use this uh, information to develop a unique plan for that patient. Mm -hmm. So although it's very similar from patient to patient, there's small little differences and nuances. Mm -hmm. These are all taken into account. So this is why it takes um, sometimes uh, three to 10 calendar days, sometimes even uh, two weeks, mm -hmm. to actually develop the specific plan for that individual. Mm -hmm. We also do a lot of quality assurance. So that means that at each step of the process, and there may be five or 10 10 steps through mm -hmm. this whole period of time. Uh, there's quality assurance done by a second person or even more in order to guarantee that at each step things have been done properly. Mm -hmm. So at the end then we have a good plan which we believe we can deliver in a reliable way on a daily basis throughout the entire course of treatment. 
okay. on it from Monday to Friday. Okay. So that's the uh, upfront. That's why the scan is needed. Now, if you have a very superficial spot on your skin, and we're going to treat it by just looking at it and marking it up on the skin, mm -hmm. then we may not need the CAT scan, say, for instance, of the hand. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, some of the treatment that we do on the surface only, um, you can use the scan uh, to get um, more information. So even in that situation, may, may, may well do a scan. Okay, all right, brilliant. Now, that, oh, I should just add that the price of that scan is included in the overall oh, okay, uh, cost. Yes. Okay. We do not, all of the planning, the scan, all of the education around that mm -hmm. uh, is all covered by, uh, within the envelope of the treatment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. Now, funny enough, we've actually run out of time. Yes. But before we go, I just want to just very quickly um, just touch on starting and continuing daily treatments. So if you could just very quickly just tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, on the first day, there's some uh, quality assurance done as well. So mm -hmm. the first session takes a bit longer. It could take half an hour or 45 mm -hmm. minutes. After that, most of the treatment sessions are 10 or 15 minutes in the actual area where the machine is. Okay. So we recommend that people come about uh, 15 minutes before, and then they can leave promptly after the treatment because mm -hmm. they don't feel unwell from that treatment. Okay. Uh, if they're seeing the nurse or seeing the doctor for an assessment, which happens at least once a week, mm -hmm. uh, then on one of those days that they're there during the week, they'll be there twice as long or three times as long in order to allow that assessment to hap to happen. Okay. Um, so otherwise, it's very routine. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Now, sorry again, we have run out of time. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much information. Yes. Um, so if anybody wants to just really find out, is there a way that they can get in touch if they want some more information? Absolutely. So our office is here in St. Lucia. We are located at the Tapion Hospital mm -hmm. and uh, our contact number 459-2201. Excellent. Yes. Well, thank you very much for joining us so, um, today. This information is vital and it's wonderful that you're here with us to make sure that everybody in St. Lucia knows about the treatment that's available out there. And oh, thank you, so everybody, much. for watching Issues and Answers. Please stay tuned to the National Television Network. Until next time, bye-bye.